the devil is a liar. Say, I am, I am vigilant, vigilant and, I and I recognize the move of God in my life. tonight is to provide information about the two types of poverty, to explain the mental models of economic class, and to give examples of hidden rules among classes. The first point I want to make is economic class is relative. Poverty and wealth, um, it might be the same it might um, be considered different among the classes. You might be considered wealthy in Memphis, but you might be considered poor in New York. So some people say, I, I grew up poor and I never knew it. Well, if everybody lives like, you know, lives the same, then you would think that, well, I'm, I'm doing just as good as everyone else. In order to better understand people from poverty, the definition of poverty will be for this presentation, the extent to which an individual does without resources. And the resources are the following. Financial, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, support systems, relationships, role models, and knowledge of hidden rules. People, sometimes people consider themselves to be wealthy because of their finances. But we know that sometimes people come into wealth, they might have won the lottery, or they might have became a professional athlete. But you need a stability in all areas in order to function in wealth or into another economic class. And so many times we find that people will lose the money because they didn't have the other areas necessary to function in a new area. Generational poverty is considered um, poverty if it's for two generations or more. However, situational poverty may occur if there's an illness or a death or a loss of a job, but it's still poverty. You know, right now, which we don't claim in the body of, of faith, we're not experiencing the same things, but in the world, people are, are experiencing a different type of poverty because they're losing jobs, they've depended on a, on a different system which wasn't the system of faith that we depend on. And so poverty might occur because of some of those other reasons outside of um, several generations of poverty. A mental model is an internal picture. It's, it's how, how the world works inside of your own mind. It exists below awareness. There are theories in use often unexamined, and they determine how we act. They can help or interfere with our learning. However, for a dialogue to occur, we must suspend our mental models. So a mental model is basically a paradigm. That's what it is. We talk about having a paradigm shift. It's a way of thinking that's inside of your head. And we often assume that the way we think inside of our mind is how everybody else thinks. And I have, for right now, I want everybody to close their eyes quickly and think about peace. Get a picture of peace in your mind. Now open your eyes. <laughs> you see it? Yep. Isn't that, doesn't that look beautiful? Yep. Isn't that what you think of? That's yep. peace. Yep. Now close your eyes again. It's time for a paradigm shift. Right. Open your eyes. Look at peace. <laughs> so we have a picture in our minds of what things look like if we don't rightly divide the word of God but today, I'm just talking about having a mental picture and having a mental picture of what poverty is, what middle class is, what wealth is. And so what our mental picture is, it might not reflect what's reality. The driving forces for poverty are survival, relationships, and entertainment. For middle class, their work, achievement, and material security and for wealth, their financial, political, and social connections. And so 
what our driving forces are are completely different. So today, I'm going to, for example, if you were going on an international trip, there are some things that you would need. And we all assume that, um, we might assume if we've already been on an international trip that everybody should know what those things are. Raise your hand if you've been on an international trip before. Right. So what are some of the things that you need on an international trip? A passport. That's one of the main things that's going to be necessary. But imagine if you got a ticket to Paris and you've never been on an international trip and nobody ever told you what you would need. And let's say you, you got on your flight and you actually made it to Paris because you had a ticket. But guess what? You have to go all the way back home because you did not have a passport. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are hidden rules. Because we assume that people know how somebody is thinking. And so I'm going to talk about the hidden rules of poverty, middle class, and wealth. And I gave everybody a sheet so that we can follow along. The work that I'm discussing with you today comes from Bridges Out of Poverty and their strategies for professional and communities um, to help people to get out of poverty, to get out of poverty not just financially, but in the, all those other areas that I discussed earlier. An individual brings with him or her the hidden rules of the class in which she's raised. So sometimes we'll say, well, that person should have known better. You know, at our jobs or in our churches, we'll say, well, they should have known better than to do that. Well, we were all raised in different places and different areas and with different hidden rules. Some people know, don't do that to mama. You know, don't you say that. And we assume that everybody should know because we grew up with those rules. Most schools and businesses actually operate from a, a middle class norm. So they use the hidden rules of middle class. So sometimes a teacher might say, that, why would that child do that? You know, why did they steal some, some extra cookies? Well, they didn't know. They didn't know that whoever the child was, they don't have any food at home. But they send them to get a suspension instead of knowing that they had a, a, a actual need. So in order to build relationships of mutual respect between economic classes, we need to be aware of more than one set of hidden rules. So the more we understand how class affects us, we're more open to hear how it affects other people, and then the more effective we can become. So in order to achieve, one may have to give up relationships for at least a time. Now they made this a key point because often in poverty we see we would see people as a possession. So if you, if, if you had several generations of people who didn't go to college or maybe they didn't serve in the military and you, you might not have an understanding of letting go. You might not want to let go because that's all you have. You might, you might not have a wealth of money, but you have wealth in relationships and in people. And so it's very, it might be more difficult to let go because you, you don't, you, you've not had to do it. However, in middle class, they might, they know that, okay, my children are going to go to college, and what college are you going to go to? So they look forward to that time of letting go, and their hope is they won't come back. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to get into the hidden rules. In poverty, people are possessions like we just talked about, because they're, they may be rich in relationships, but not other areas. In middle class, things are, are possessions. I want a lot of things. I gotta get that new shoe, those new, those shoes are bad. I gotta have them. You know, I gotta get this new car, that's gonna make me. And in wealth, um, possessions are one of a kind objects, legacies. Pedigrees, it's, uh, there are things that I can leave on. They're going to acquire value after I'm gone. In poverty, time present is most important. Decisions made for the moment based on feelings or survival because they have so many things, so many fires to put out. If one thing happens, if the car doesn't work or if the bus didn't come on time, now I can't get where I need to go. So the present is most important. They're not considering the future ramifications of decisions. In middle class, the future is most important. 
They are their decisions are made against future ramifications. For example, if you are in poverty and you have just a job and it's paying minimum wage and your boss make you mad, you might say, "Hey, you ain't paying me nothing but minimum wage. I'm out the door. You know, you're not really helping me. You know, so I can go and find another job." However, in middle class, you might have a career, and so saying "I'm out the door" is not really the same option because you got a mortgage you know you got a vacation you're waiting on you have some children you have some student loans and so you have to time is future most important for middle class and in wealth um, decisions are made partially on the basis of traditional decorum or traditions in history are most important money in poverty, money is used to be spent. When it hits my hand, it's gone. It ne I, it, I need to spend this. It's in my hand. I, I need to go and buy something. I haven't had an opportunity to buy. I need to pay a bill. I haven't had an opportunity to pay a bill. And I, I want to say that I'm not saying that one is better than the other. We're just showing different paradigms. We're showing some of the mental models or how somebody in, in one of these classes might think. And so these... The patterns that they're exposing through this research has been over 20 years of research, and there are some exceptions. So, like I said, poverty is not just about finances. So this can be in any area. In middle class, money is used to be managed, because I know I have this coming, and I have this other situation up before me, and I know that in a few months we're going to go to Disneyland, so or wherever they decide to go. In wealth, money is made to be conserved and invested. They're thinking about the future. I want to conserve this money. I want to invest it for my children, my children's children, and so on. Love. We, we talk about love all the time. It's the body of believers. In poverty, love and acceptance is conditional. It's based on whether or not I like you. If I like you today, then I, I still love you if I like you. In middle class, love and access, acceptance is conditional based largely on achievement. And I can attest to this. Um, since I have not been on that ladder, um, a lot of the relationships that I had have faltered away. Thank you, Lord. But I haven't, you know, the acceptance that I would have gotten by staying on that ladder, you know, where you need to go to college and then you need to go to grad school and you might get your doctorate if you didn't get married, you know. And if you get married, you better start having some kids because you know you're getting old. Like God is not the author of time, but we're going to move on. Well, love and acceptance are conditional and related to social standing and connections. So we will still accept you if you, you're not being scandalized in the news because you're going to affect my generations. Wow. But we know, thank God for kingdom. Love and acceptance is unconditional. Right. We just love, and that's, that's the end of it. Social emphasis. In poverty, we include you if we like you. That's it. <laughs> and middle class is based. It's based on self-governance and self-sufficiency. So if it's going to help me out, if I'm going to um, move on up that ladder, then you can be a part of my group. And in wealth, it's on social exclusion. We hear about those um, nice country clubs that even Oprah can't get into because she's new money and we're old money. The more we can exclude you, um, that's, that's where it's at. Personality. In poverty, your personality is for entertainment. Your sense of humor is highly valued. If I can make you laugh, I'm in. That's it. I could be robbing you, but if I can make you laugh, we tight. So, in middle class, it's for acquisition and stability because achie achievement is highly valued. If I can keep on acquiring things and it can make me stable where I am, I can be comfortable, then, you know, that's, that's, that's where the personality um, of each other or how we know that we, are, we will get along well. So, and for wealth, it's for connections. 
Financial, political, and social connections are highly valued. So their personality is all about networking. I'm going to do what I have to do to connect financially, politically, or socially. Food. <laughs> and poverty, the question is, did you have enough? Quantity is important. We, we like to make sure it's enough for everybody. Everybody got to eat. I, I like that. In middle class, the quality is important. Did you like it? Was that good? However, in wealth is, was it presented well? Presentation is important. And so, you know, you can go to an event for wealthy people, and it might be a very small portion. And it's because it's all about presentation. You might have paid a $1,000 ticket for a fundraising event, and then you got a little baby quiche. <laughs> And, but it was presented well, so we have, we all have, we have our differences. Clothing. Yes, clothing. In poverty, clothing value for individual style and expression of personality. And middle class is label important. You better be looking, it better be a label on it. Because I got to show this off. So I can be accepted into the middle class. So let me let me make sure. Let me check that bag. Hold up. Oh, wait. From Walmart? Uh-uh. No. Let me get this label. And it's made by the same people. But that label on it, that label, wealth, clothing value for, our, for its artistic sense and expression is designer important. So now we didn't took it a step higher. We might have a label, but it, ain't des it, it needs to be a designer. Destiny. In poverty, they believe um, in fate. Because I can't do much to mitigate chance. You know, I'm just living this life day to day. Every day I'm just trying to make it. So if something good happened, it's just by chance. If something bad happened, hey, what could I have done to prevent it? You know, in middle class, they we believe in choice. Um, can change future with good choices now. So it's not just a day-to-day -day thought. Um, and then wealth is noble or more obligation, and it's noblesse oblige. It means that it's just um, our, our destiny is um, of more obligation to those of high birth, powerful social position, and to act with honor, kindness, and generosity. Education. Um, poverty is valued and revered as abstract but not reality, meaning that, you know, you might say, so are you going, you know, when are you going to graduate or what school are you going to um, or are you going to college versus in middle classes, what college are you going to? Have you decided what are you going to do when you get, you know, eight, when you turn 18, what decisions have you made? And in wealth, it's just a necessary tradition for making and maintaining connections. You know, we know some of our famous presidents who went to very prestigious schools and you know we've seen their records but it was a necessary tradition they knew they had the connections and they could get into the schools and it was about maintaining those connections worldview in poverty you might see the world in terms of, of a local setting and I don't mean in terms of it for example Memphis I mean South Memphis or North Memphis
don't mean in terms of, it, for example, Memphis. I mean South Memphis or North Memphis or just Westwood. Some people have never been outside of their neighborhoods. And so their worldview is what's happening in my neighborhood. In middle class, you see the world in a national setting. What's going on in the government? You know, what's happening in politics? And in wealth, they see the world in terms of an international view, the global market. You know, they might have a favorite restaurant in Paris, not just a favorite food in the city. Humor. In poverty, people laugh and talk about people. <laughs> in middle class, we talk about situations. You remember that time when so-and-so happened? And in wealth, they talk about social faux pas, basically laughing at us when we didn't know to pick the right spoon or the right fork at a nice dinner table. Yeah. Family structure. In poverty, it tends to be matriarchal, meaning, you know, it's mother-led. In middle class, it's, it tends to be father-led. And in wealth, it depends on who has the money. Power is linked to personal respect, your ability to fight. In poverty, it's, I mean, it is, because you're you protecting yourself. That's, if you don't have a lot of other things, then that's, that's where your, your power comes from, your ability to protect. In middle class, power and respect is separated. Um, it's, it responds to position, um, a hierarchy of authority, um, power and information and institutions. So the, you might get a, a doctorate and be considered um, powerful, even if you not powerful, you know, you don't really have anything else. And wealth, powers and expertise and connections, influences policy and direction. So they might have connections with international leaders and language. And poverty is usually casual register. Language is about survival. And middle class is formal register. Language is about negotiation. And in wealth, formal register. Language is about networking. The research shows in language in children ages 1 to 4 in a stable household by economic group, the number of words exposed to for welfare economic group was 13 million. For every one affirmation, there were two prohibitions meaning that for every no, sit down, shut up, there was one thing that you might have did right. And then working class, there were 26 million words. And in, profes in professionals group, there were 45 million words. And six affirmations for every one prohibition. So we, can, we see that um, teaching our children language is very important. I know here we're talking about kingdom language and knowing words and knowing the word of God. It's the same. You know, how we operate and what, what economy we're operating in in terms of the word, it's the same. If you only know a little bit of word, you're, you're not operating to your capacity. You're not going to be able to function in each area. Registers of language, because I told you that there were, you know, casual and also formal. There's also frozen, what you say, the Lord's Prayer, or wedding vows, formal, um, complete sentences, specific word choice, consultative, casual. It's what you use between friends and intimate. Casual register versus formal. What's up? How are you doing? My bad. It was my fault. Please excuse me. I accept responsibility for my grievous error. I apologize for my faux pas. Groan. Ugh. Versus, I made a mistake. I feel uncomfortable. Or simply, I do not wish to comply with your request. Would you consider an alternative? Sometimes what's really separating us is just a lack of language. The lack of vocabulary to express what we really want to say. And here are a few more examples, casual register versus formal. What you say versus can you repeat that, please? And hook me up versus would you be so kind as to introduce me to? Or I would really appreciate your assistance. And that's tight, that's cool, or that's the bomb versus I would like to compliment you on your choice of 
whatever that is. This is an excellent suggestion, or this activity overwhelmed me with its outstanding value and significance to my future. <laughs> okay, so I hope that I provided you with enough information to have um, an overall view of generational and situational poverty, which was generational was for two generations or more versus situation was loss of a job or illness or um, maybe um, someone died, but a situation that you couldn't prevent that caused poverty. And I gave you an example of a mental model, what it was, and for each economic class, and I gave you examples of hidden rules. So I hope that you guys have acquired some knowledge that you didn't have to help you to operate um, at church, at home, in your jobs. I know one woman, she said, I wish I had known this before I divorced my husband. Her husband was from generational poverty, and she was middle class. And her husband would continuously use her toothbrush, and she couldn't get past it. And she was like, why is he using my toothbrush? Well, in the household he grew up in, they shared because there was such a scarcity of resources. And so he, didn't, he wasn't meaning to offend her, but it was just a lack of language. They didn't take the time to communicate, and he didn't know how to express why it was okay for him and why <laughs> she couldn't get past it. But sometimes what's a barrier between us is a lack of vocabulary, a lack of language. And so I hope that you guys have learned something new that you can take with you um, that can be a seed for your generations. And I just thank everybody for your time. People of God, like I said again, I'm Benjamin Allen, pastor of this great ministry, Matthew 633 Church Ministries Incorporated. If you're watching this broadcast and you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that right now. You can say a simple prayer. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. If you confess that, you are now saved. And now what I'm asking you to do is to forsake not to assemble yourself together in a church. Of course, you know the power of repentance. Um, I trust that when you made that affirmation, when you made that confirmation, that you know that you have to turn, repent means to turn, to stop doing wrong, to stop sinning according to the word of God. So give God your life and he will make it better for you. He will take your broken pieces and put you back together better than you were before. And also get in a good Bible teaching church and the Apostle Paul asked some of the disciples of Jesus Christ that had the water baptism of John. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said they had not have heard of such things. So he laid hands on them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. So the Holy Ghost is a gift. It is free. All you have to do is ask for it. Ask God. Seek him. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Receive it. It's a free gift. I want to pray for someone that's watching right now. You may have a sickness in your body. You may have a situation financially. I don't know what it is, but Heavenly Father, I release an anointing right now for provision to destroy every yoke, to break it and destroy every yoke of sickness and disease. I come against every spirit of infirmity. I come against a strong man. I come against principalities and high places. In the name of Jesus Christ, just like Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, then he said to loose him and let him go. I command right now in the name of Jesus that you've been loosed and you've been let go. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And he saw that it was good. Until next time, God bless you.